Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon your time zone. Thank you for joining us today for advancing transform transformative changes through biodiversity law and governance. My name is Freedom Kai Phillips. I am the Leverhulme Trust Visiting Professor Coordinator at the University of Cambridge and the Operations Director for the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. I will be acting as one of your Zoom moderators today. My colleague, Ms. Dantine Fan, is uh, a former LLM candidate and graduate of the University of Cambridge, and she works out of the Beijing office for Climate Zero. I would like to hand over the floor to our chair today, Dr. Professor Mary Claire Cordoner Seger, the visiting professor, the Leverhulme visiting professor at the University of Cambridge, the senior director of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law and the Executive Secretary of the Biodiversity Law and Governance Initiative. Thank you very much, uh, Freedom Kai and also Dantine. And it's wonderful to be with you here today. This roundtable takes place in a very special context. We are of course on the International Day of Biological Diversity and we are also meeting in the weekend in between some extremely important meetings of the Convention on Biological Diversity. In 2021, more broadly, countries are facing critical global challenges which will define the next decades, perhaps centuries, for all of our civilizations on this earth. The risks are real and the scientists which interprets them is well recognized. For years, even as globalization gained speed, delivering equivocal benefits to millions, we have also been warned of the emerging vulnerabilities. Scientists and others in the World Health Organization already underlined the serious risks of global pandemics. And now these are reality with the emergence of a novel coronavirus with the deadly COVID-19 outbreaks. Scientists, journalists, and others in nature conservation circles, including the CBD regime, have highlighted the risks and realities of a global biodiversity crisis with thousands of entire species, their natural habitats and ecosystems on the brink of collapse, due in part to our development choices. Students have joined scientists and many others in climate action circles, underscoring the risks and realities of a global climate crisis. In a way, our civilization has reached a crossroads with the global economy, nature, and our community's well-being, all depending on an ambivalent capacity for compliance with our biodiversity and climate commitments. Humanity's capacity to adopt and implement solutions in time is still very far from certain. When countries celebrated the adoption of the Aichi targets under the CBD in 2010, a certain sense of constrained optimism permeated the plans of government authorities, international organizations, business communities, even the normally fairly critical academic and civil society circles. However, implementation of the global biodiversity strategy of the CBD itself and its protocols is not just an environment or economic challenge, it's a development challenge, responding directly to the world's sustainable development goals. In 2021, achievement of many of these SDGs and also the obligations under the CBD, its protocols and its strategy is still very much a work in progress, a work in progress that depends on effective, sticky, sustainable biodiversity law and governance reforms at all levels for success. The drafting, adoption and enforcement of national policy, regulatory and institutional frameworks to achieve higher ambition for biodiversity especially mainstreaming, remains an ongoing challenge. Courts are not unwilling to resolve disputes on a case-by-case -case basis. Indeed, litigation on biodiversity is proceeding in domestic courts all the time. Studies have also identified thousands of laws and policy initiatives set in place to address the biodiversity crisis, and there is a great deal to be learned from these recent innovations. However, we still face the danger of making legal interventions too little, too late. More diverse, carefully tailored law and policy measures are needed to address widely different national circumstances and to move towards a global economy that respects the limits and contributions of biodiversity protection and sustainable use 
and access to genetic resources, particularly in the context of post-pandemic economic stimulus. It is in this context that we hold this Biodiversity Law and Governance Roundtable. The enormity of the challenge for the law and indeed for all disciplines and professions is clear. Effective, accountable national and international law and sustainable development, especially to support CBD and its protocols implementation has never been more important. And this is doubly so as countries struggle to set measures in place to speed economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Across all fields and professions, in each country and region of the world, hundreds, perhaps thousands of capable, informed jurists specialized in biodiversity are needed to bridge a gaping capacity chasm. The best and brightest of our law students from all countries and the world's leading centers of legal education and research, together with our cooperative governments, our business community, and many, many others, not least civil society itself, have a critical opportunity to make a decisive contribution to the highest possible ambition in our global response to biodiversity crisis. In this context, I am actually filled with optimism in opening this legal roundtable today. We have two very interesting um, roundtables that we're going to be celebrating together with um, uh, some marvelous legal experts who will be introduced shortly. And we also have a little gap in between to be able to celebrate also the launching of a few very special initiatives, which I am so impressed that all of our team, noting especially Freedom Kai Phillips and Danting Fan, who are serving as our Zoom moderators, um, have helped to make a reality. We're very, very fortunate that we're joined here, not just by one of the leading biodiversity law professionals and um, professors, uh, Professor Jorge Cabrera, who is with me today as my co-chair and shall be chairing the second round table, but also by a leading figure from one of my own countries, Canada, in these debates, the co-chair of the CBD Post-2020 Open-Ended Working Group, Basil van Havre. Basil, you have an extremely impressive CV and the work that you've done in the Canadian government is known to us all, not the least on some of the most important and pressing files that we've faced, not just in our country, but globally. But rather than taking the time of the group to, to read out the biography and photograph that we've sent them all, I am going to instead give you that extra time and invite you to make a few opening remarks. Good, uh, <clears throat> good day to all of you and, and especially to you, Marie-Claire. Um, it's a pleasure to, to address you. It's a pleasure to, uh, to take some time on, on, on weekend. I think uh, probably like most of you, the weekend is a time for reflection and, and uh, I am quite happy to be participating in those roundtables and, and to uh, feed and nurture that ongoing discussion. Um, I think some, some of you have told me that I'm an old friend of CISDL and, and I'm quite delighted to, to, to be taken as such. Uh, we, we need this capacity. As a, I, was, I was more of a user and an abuser of your capacity. Colleagues, we're facing a very difficult situation. The discussion ongoing, we're working virtually. This is not a panacea. This is a very difficult way to do business. And at the same time, we're trying to do something that has not been done before. We're trying to do a framework for all. We're trying to combine and mismatch um, a variety of initiative. And that is making the, the job more complex. At the same time, the stakes are higher. We know about the situation of IWC. We have no choice but to be successful. So I'm not gonna give you the speech of Winston Churchill that's why it's in tears, but what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is General de Gaulle call from, uh, call for all the, the brave souls. And what we need, and what I meant by that, is that we're gonna need better and more legal advice, better and more legal reflection, because that we're gonna have to make up for the deficiencies in our process through better advice. Those of you that have listened to the debates that took place uh, over the, the last few days, 
I heard many, many times and again reference to uh, we need advice, we need more certainty. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, really happy to see the, the brain trust around this virtual table. I'm looking forward um, to see what we do. We know that we share a vision for restoring biodiversity to one where we see one people and nature as one. We're going to need some very clear advice and pathway when we look at the various targets. Those around land protection, those around indigenous people rights and, and their engagement in the management of those issues. How are we going to deal with knowledge sharing and the sharing of the benefits arising from biodiversity? Uh, you have my commitment to listen very carefully uh, to your debates and to make maximum use. And I'll take good notes and, and keep that list of people and be sure that I will be calling you at one point or the other and, not, and, and tapping you on the shoulder for some additional details. I haven't been known to do that, to do that as my Claire can attest. And, and that's going to be very important. I'm confident we can do it. I want to give you a message of hope. There is an immense pile of work in front of us, but uh, with uh, our determination and the energy of this group, we can do it. So I'm looking forward to the upcoming exciting event, uh, the 2021 Biodiversity Law and Governance Initiative. Thank you, Michael. Back to you. Thank you very, very much, Basil. And uh, I know how busy you are and the fact that you've been able to join us today and that you're willing especially to congratulate and celebrate some very special people that we're going to be mentioning in just a little while is, is deeply meaningful to us. And it shows that, that our contributions and our commitment to the CBD is, is respected and needed, which is an important message. Thank you. I also have one other important message, of course, that I've agreed to add today. And it is from the executive secretary of the CBD secretariat, a very old friend, um, Elizabeth Maruma Marema. And uh, she has sent us the following message, which she's asked me to share with you today before I invite, of course, my co-chair, Professor Jorge Cabrera, to just briefly walk you through the agenda and start the first panel. Distinguished experts and guests, on this International Day for Biological Diversity, on a theme, we are part of the solution. I am delighted to send my welcome and best wishes to all of you joining this important biodiversity legal roundtable. A roundtable hosted by so many engaged and supportive partners, launching a series of key international events of the 2021 Biodiversity Law and Governance Initiative. The events will support and promote the legal and institutional aspects of implementing our beloved Convention on Biological Diversity and its protocols. While I cannot be with you in person due to the intensity of work during these days, it is my pleasure to wish you well in your expert deliberations and valuable dialogue. Global efforts and transformative changes will be needed to build and implement a robust post-2020 global biodiversity framework to be adopted at the Convention's Conference of the Parties, COP15, to be held in Kunming, China later this year. I am honored to see all continued efforts to strengthen and promote biodiversity, particularly given the long-standing cooperation for education, research, and technical capacity building through the Biodiversity Law and Governance Initiative of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law and all its partners. I'm especially honored to send my warmest congratulations to the winners of the International Legal Specialist Awards for Biodiversity from the last few years. For these winners, please accept my grateful recognition from the impressive global efforts you have all been leading over the years in biodiversity law and governance. Thank you all and good luck in your deliberations today and in all your contributions to the conservation and sustainable use of our planet's fragile webs of biological diversity. And that's Elizabeth Maruma Maema, Executive Secretary of the CBD. So with that, I'd like to say that we are just about opening our uh, round table. And I would like to also ask Professor Jorge Cabrera, who has been part of this regime leading the way from Costa Rica um, since the beginning to say a few words of welcome before we start our first round table. Jorge. Uh, thank you very much, Marie Clerk, and good afternoon or good morning for everybody. Um, I'm, I'm very honored, I'm very pleased to be here and to share with you uh, some of my initial views um, about uh, this excited event. 
Uh, of course, the event will be uh, focused on the critical role that is playing by biodiversity laws, governance, and biodiversity policies in healthy nature. Sometimes, perhaps, we can use the, the word nature instead of biodiversity. I think uh, it's more, more close to people. So basically what um, we require is to look at how these transformations, how these changes can be achieved through biodiversity law policies and governance. And I think this is critical. Uh, there are many, many examples of the, of, of the role that uh, the laws can play in achieving sustainable use, conservation, and benefit sharing from biodiversity, achieving the IG targets, and of course now the role that it, that the laws can play in, in, in promoting, in supporting the post-2020 agenda in many areas, wildlife, protected areas, payment for ecosystem services, uh, linkages with climate change and other international regimes, trade laws, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to open this exciting exchange of views regarding what will be the, the, the role of the laws. What are the legal obstacles that we are facing? What can we learn from past environmental or biodiversity laws uh, implementation experiences? What can be replicated successfully? Um, without any further delay, um, I, I, I also, uh, Congratulate CISDL for the organization of this um, important and, and timely uh, roundtable in the middle of the of this also quite important negotiations. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jorge, especially for your hard work in making this roundtable possible, together with Dunting and many others. I will now ask our first speakers who are joining us for the round table to turn on their cameras. Jorge's camera will stay on because he has been asked to make a substantive intervention in the session. And in particular, I would like to ask if we could focus this session on biodiversity ambition, mobilizing legal and institutional reform for the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. There are several focus questions in front of us on the screen. How can legal and institutional reform support the formulation and implementation of a transformative post-2020 global biodiversity framework? What are the pressing legal obstacles and opportunities? What can be learned from national policy and legal experiences for mainstreaming biodiversity across all sectors? And how to support them with world-class assessment, accounting, public engagement, other governance systems? And of course, how to incentivize and more ambitious long-term biodiversity strategies in the context of pandemic recovery investments and how to enhance the role of biodiversity law in this respect. So what we are going to ask to do, because this is meant to be a participatory exchange, is to first have our top legal experts who have been invited to intervene, starting with Dr. Balakrishna Pisupati, and then Professor Jorge Cabrera, and then Dr. or Professor Robert Kibugi, and if he's able to join us online, Advocate Frederick Perron Welsh, maybe just two or three minutes, four minutes maximum, to give us your answer to one of these questions, two at the maximum. That will start the dialogue, and you then have a chance to not only respond to each other, but also we are joined online by a group of interveners who have been invited to be able to be with us in this circle and pose their questions to you directly. At the same time, for those of you, and I see there are over 130 watching online and more that are going to be joining us later to watch the recording, what I would love for to, that, to, to, to see happen is that if you have questions for any of the legal experts, whether the speakers or the interveners, you post them in the Q&A function. Our Zoom moderators will be picking up your questions with your name, your country, and your affiliation, and they will be grouping them in groups of three. And when we can, we will be turning to them, asking for three more questions, and then turning back to our legal experts for some answers. So this way, indeed, we actually are able to have an exchange, even though, of course, it's not in person. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who we are truly deeply honored. He is an old friend of the CISDL, and we have really enjoyed our work with him and our interactions on his many publications and technical capacity work and other changes he's made. 
Dr. Balakrishna Pisupati is, of course, an internationally acclaimed conservation and development expert with close to three decades of experience working on issues of conservation and science policy interveys. He's held positions such as head of biodiversity, land law and governance program at UNEP, coordinator of the biodiplomacy program at the UN University, chairperson of the National Biodiversity Authority of, for the Government of India, and also vice chancellor of the Transdisciplinary University of India, which I just think is one of the most beautiful initiatives that we have today in this world. Currently with UNEP, he focuses on issues of science policy interface and international environmental governance. We're deeply honored that you can join us today. Please, Dr. Bala, if you could give us just a, an idea of which question you're willing to answer and the beginnings of your answer, knowing we will be coming back to you throughout this whole discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mary Claire, and uh, thank you, Ohe, uh, uh, old friends. And uh, certainly let me start by thanking CISDL for this wonderful initiative. And as uh, Mary Claire mentioned, it has been an honor and a pleasure to be associated with this initiative uh, for long. Uh, so certainly thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, start by congratulating the winners of the special awards uh, who will be uh, celebrated during the course of the event. So speakers, panel members, participants, and I had, we had uh, a very, very famous ornithologist uh, in India by name Sally Mali. And he said, in conservation, every small success has to be celebrated very big. So here we are convening on the 22nd of May for the International Day for Biological Diversity. And we have before us uh, a set of pointed issues to deliberate, to brainstorm. And having it is having 14 cops of the CBD so far. If there is one thing which I would like to pick in terms of my focus during this short intervention, that will be the global biodiversity framework, not only in terms of agreeing on the targets and the implementation plans, but more importantly, spend more energies as we are doing now in terms of implementing the framework as and when it gets adopted mainstreaming. I'm sure for those of you who are a part of this particular discourse, I've heard mainstreaming for many, many, many years, and we have had a number of initiatives focusing on many mainstreaming, almost from the beginning of the conventions, its scops and the decisions and the discussions. And this is an important issue for the discussion today, because in as much as we discuss mainstreaming in terms of mainstreaming into agriculture, forestry, fisheries, there is one very special element of this mainstreaming to an extent uh, some of us fail to appreciate, support, and also enhance the visibility of that particular component that is related to the legal and policy dimensions of how to strengthen biodiversity conservation, implementation of the different decisions of not just the convention, but also mm -hmm. the national plans. Because there is no one country that can develop a policy framework or a legal framework unless there is mainstreaming that is going to be the basis for the discussion of policy development. Yes, yes. You take all the eight national biodiversity strategies and action plans that are with us. The first round of action plans, the second round of strategies post to 2010. If there is one message that has come out very clearly through that process is that focusing on policy formulation, focusing on legal framework development, <laughs> we effectively implement our biodiversity targets starting from 2002 and 2010 to 11 to 2020 and into the future, it's the legal and policy frameworks that offer a, a brilliant platform for us to start looking at mainstream. But the challenge in terms of where we stand with that particular issue <clears throat> is that in as much as we use NBSAPs, for example, and the legal and policy frameworks that support the implementation of the national biodiversity strategies and action plans, two challenges countries face that countries should start looking right away. Given the delays we have had in terms of adopting this particular new framework, the post-2020 framework, unfortunately, things which are out of, out of our hands because of the pandemic are the following. Number one is how do we align our legal systems? How do I align our policies 
in terms of strengthening the already available and the existing natural biodiversity strategies so that by the time we adopt and agree on the global biodiversity framework we already have a framework we already have a national level document a national level policy a national level focal uh, you know issue that we can start using and this is your 30 point. second warning yeah so the second second point is that in as much as we would like to use the nbsaps it is also very important for countries to start looking at lessons learned 2011 to 2020 in terms of where we were unable to use the nbsaps as an effective framework to the extent we wanted to do and then see how the experiences of aligning the the, the 2011 to 2020 process and the post 2020 framework can certainly help us to shape the discussions that are ongoing now through the SBI and the SUPSTA meetings, but also through the open ended working group to finalize and submit the draft to the COP, but also the outcomes of COPs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to be very strict, including with my own co-chair. Jorge, would you like to um, now just give your brief answer to a second question that is equally pressing in this, um, in this debate? Thank you very much, uh, Mary Claire. Yes, I, I will focus my intervention on actually on the last one on how to enhance the role of biodiversity law in addressing future pandemics. Um, uh, at CISDL, we are currently uh, researching a little bit on how biodiversity laws, how biodiversity comprehensive laws can play a role in addressing and preventing future pandemics like the COVID-19 and, and, and others. Um, I would like to start by saying that many international well-known reports, including the IPES report on biodiversity and pandemics, but others by CITES, WHO, UNEP, and other non-governmental organizations, uh, have pointed out the connection between the lack of environment, appropriate environmental conditions, environmental management, and the, the emergence, the raising of of pandemics and and of course uh, looking at this at this information one of the main uh, conclusions one of the main steps to be taken is basically to to look at how the laws can play a role addressing the roots addressing the factors behind the emergence of pandemics and um, having said that what we are trying to identify is in current biodiversity laws, what are the main components that can be identified as a, a tools and mechanisms to address and to prevent pandemics? Just, uh, just uh, let me give you an example of the of some of the results. For instance, the principles. In many of these laws, there are very relevant principles, including the precautionary approach or principle, prevention, equity, uh, the non-regression principle. This emerging idea of the rights of nature is also being included in few of the new, new biodiversity laws and policies. The integration principle, um, in terms also of the measures that are included in these laws, in many of these laws, you can identify, for instance, measures targeted to in situ a conservation, including to prevent or to avoid deforestation land uh, land use change or at least to minimize land use change also there is a component of many of these laws uh, regarding exotic species wildlife management biosecurity we are here not only talking about the gmos but we are talking about the introduction of other species in particular areas so the the exotic species uh, uh, field the biosecurity in, in in a more in a more uh, comprehensive uh, meaning or sense. We also can be able to identify that are environmental impact assessment components in some of these laws that also can be used to prevent, of course, the impact of human activities on the emergence of pandemics. Uh, incentives, including the payment for environmental services, but many others are also a, a, a regular component of some of these laws. The restoration of e ecosystems protected areas and more important or equally important other area-based mechanisms, which I, I think are key, uh, a critical element of many of these laws. And something that is very important, but sometimes 
uh, hidden, which is the, the protection of TK and the dissemination of this information that can be extremely useful in order to fight future pandemics. The identification of ecosystem and threats to ecosystem as part of the uh, 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 planning processes. And something that is equally important and sometimes also hidden is the component of these laws of research, data management, generation of information, science and technology, and technology transfer, which I think can play a critical role as well, jointly with other, other of course, areas of law like health, uh, et cetera. The planning process, the strong planning process that is included in many of these uh, biodiversity laws, I mean, uh, jointly with uh, uh, the, the governance structure in order to put in place, to implement, to give effectiveness to all these provisions, I think it's also quite, quite important. Um, the education and public awareness uh, uh, provisions that are usually included in biodiversity laws. Then, of course, there are sanctions, funding, monitoring, and review. But if you can look at these laws, if you look at the roots of the factors or the drivers of pandemics, so there is a critical role to play. There is a clear match between how to implement, fully implement this law, how to give it as an effective tool, and the outcomes of preventing or at least minimizing the risk of future pandemics affecting nature and human. And again, it's important to recall this concept of one health, the health of nature and the health of human that are uh, linked uh, and, and connected. And this is important not only for the post-2020 agenda, but also for other uh, legal initiatives that in principle are, are coming in the next month such as the WHO Treaty on Future Pandemics. Of course, the, 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 the main content of the treaty will be the health responses. I mean, the, the identification and the declaration of pandemics and, and so on. But uh, it, it can be also considered to a certain extent, what will be the role of biodiversity law informing, for instance, this process of this WHO Treaty. Uh, so as you can see, I think there is a lot of role to be played for biodiversity loss, our, our field, uh, in, in addressing this key issue, this key topic for human development. And I'm, I'm going to stop here to, uh, I mean, to, to follow the rules of my co-chair. Thank you very, very much, Jorge. And again, that's just an introduction. We're going to come back to you and Bala and the others as soon as you've given your initial remarks. Speaking of initial remarks, I am extremely happy to be able to welcome an old friend who is, of course, a senior lecturer in law at the School of Law at the University of Nairobi and teaches in the Center for Advanced Studies of Environmental Law and the Wangari Mata Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies at that same university. Darta Kibui is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a legal specialist in exactly our area, extremely well published and extremely respected in our field. I'm very, very pleased that you're able to join us today, Robert. And again, if you can keep your remarks, initial remarks very, very brief, literally just answering one of the questions <coughs> on our screen, then uh, we will be able to actually get into some real dialogue. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marie Claire, for the very kind introduction. And it's a, it's an honor to be here again and to um, engage in the discussion. I think I will speak on the area that I'm more versed on, and that's the lessons from national policy and legislative experiences. And I'd like to um, bring about three or four different matters very quickly that perhaps can be discussed later. Um, some of the lessons I think that we're learning are not just in biodiversity conservation or just also in climate change in other areas, is that the need for cross-sectoral mainstreaming of biodiversity objectives uh, has become very critical. Um, first of all, uh, it is proving really difficult to achieve much without, for instance, cross-fertilizing biodiversity objectives with climate action. And you just need to look at NDCs and NBSAPs to see, for example, there is lack of communication in between them. Or you look at NBSAPs or NDCs from contiguous countries and you see they are not communicating. Equally, there are important areas that matter. Uh, at a meeting a few days ago, we recognize that there is a big problem in groundwater resources 
because the extensive uh, degradation of biodiversity, including from human economic activities, means that natural forms of groundwater recharge are failing. And that is extremely affecting aquifers and artificial recharges is, are going to be extremely expensive. Uh, the second uh, point that I'd like to make is that we need and we must move on, and this is going to be very controversial in many quarters, perhaps beyond here, we must move on from the notion that every form of investment is a good investment. Mm. Uh, we, we must learn how to speak loudly at investments that are trading up uh, solutions from nature and using up our budget of, of ecosystem services to leave future generations with nothing or that are worsening the level and degree of inequity and this is a conversation we can have in every form and way but this is something that needs to be taken on including by courts uh, the third point that I'd like to say is that safeguards are critical. And by safeguards, I mean that there are all those legal and policy tools that are being seen as if they're enemies of industry and investment. EIS, development permitting, um, environmental audits. Uh, these are all based on sound environmental law principles and scientific knowledge to set minimum thresholds and to protect us. Uh, they matter. And they're there to make sure that we do no harm, or at least we do the least amount of harm that is possible, and we need to respect those. Equally, so do people matter. <laughs> Even though we speak a lot about conservation of biodiversity, we as people are critical to this because we're part of the environment, and we are in a mutually uh, symbiotic relationship uh, with nature in terms of ecosystem services. But important to this is that they are a class of people that are victims of gender and social exclusion. It could be on account of uh, various reasons, uh, uh, indigenous people, local communities that are affected in very different ways by damage or harm that is coming to biodiversity on account of decisions we make and laws that we make. And we need to be conscious about this. And finally, um, coming from a lawyer, this is high, uh, um, highly unconventional, but enactment of laws is not and cannot be an automatic solution to our problems and neither can it be an end by itself. We are beginning to learn and we are learning that there are laws that are designed subjectively, negatively, and by their very nature, will always have a bad outcome for biodiversity and for people because they tend, they'll tend to favor certain uh, outcomes. These include laws that provide automatic exemptions from EIA for things like extractives in uh, protected areas, uh, the ones that set lower thresholds for public participation, the ones that fail to recognize or set barriers in the way of ecosystem services valuation, and so on and so forth. And I can give an example, for instance, is it's increasingly difficult to understand why we have environmental assessment laws uh, that are not targeting the, the use of biodiversity mitigation hierarchies for purposes of, uh, of biodiversity intensive extractive activities. And that means that by nature, uh, that law is not going to protect us and it's likely to cause a lot more harm. Uh, I was asked to speak briefly and uh, in short, and I thought that might uh, help said. Thank you very much. Thank you as well, Robert. I just want to ask if one more of our colleagues who are online can give just two or three very brief points to help us to start this dialogue before we focus more broadly. And this is, of course, a dear friend who has been with us for many years, um, a, a advocate, Frederick Perron Welsh, who is an expert in his own right and the editor of a book on the biosafety protocol with Cambridge University Press as well as a well-known um, author on many aspects of CBD implementation. Frederick? Hello. Um, I'd hoped to talk on the topic that Jorge had just mentioned, but I think that he did a good job in covering uh, some of these biodiversity and health uh, linkages. Um, I think that there's a lot to do there in, in terms of the post-2020 framework and uh, the biodiversity um, kind of action plan that, pardon me, the biodiversity and health action plan that's being developed as a part of that. And maybe um, Basil could tell us more about how that's going. Um, I'll speak to the incentivizing um, more ambitious long-term biodiversity strategies in the context of pandemic recovery investments. So um, 
I think that our main uh, challenge has been mobilizing financial resources that are adequate to the scale of the problem. Um, there was a target under uh, under the ICHI targets about um, addressing both uh, harmful and perverse incentives on uh, on that that lead to unsustainable use of biodiversity or or degradation of biodiversity. Um, I think this will be a very uh, important continuing um, subject in the post twenty twenty agenda. We really need to look at linking this to the climate regime as well, because we are talking about funds that in, in a number of cases are perverse incentives aimed at the oil and gas industries um, that for the purposes of exploration and exploitation of these uh, reserves, um, there may be tax deductions for prospecting or for various uh, activities involved with, with extraction. and. I believe that a uh, recent study had been talking about something on the magnitude of $500 billion a year spent subsidizing the oil and gas industry where we already know under you know, the sister convention that we need to be phasing this out. And much of that financing is actually presently harmful to biodiversity. And if we can redirect some of that towards at least biodiversity neutral or biodiversity positive activities, while both uh, achieving our climate goals and achieving our our goal to uh, to stop the the rapid loss of biodiversity, um, I think that we uh, we face a really a great opportunity to try and use some of the funds that are already being spent by the public sector, but orienting them in a good way. Um, and I think that this needs to also be uh, international and, and needs to be based on. Uh, you know, providing finances to developing countries so that they can achieve the incremental costs of meeting the, the their goals under and, and duties under the convention. Um, and that this has to be done, uh, for example, in the forest context as a way to finance the provision of global public goods and not as some kind of overseas development assistance based on, um, you know, kind of domestic variables that may be increased or decreased depending on domestic policy priorities, but instead, you know, this is a, there are global ecosystem services being provided here and they need to be paid for by somebody and they can't just be uh, uh, dealt with on the fringes of, uh, of I guess, international financing. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and, uh, and we can go from here. Thank you. Those are excellent points. I'm now going to ask is everyone who is here online with us inside the firewall, our interveners and also our legal experts who are joining us on the second round table, including the legal specialist award winners from uh, 2020, 2019 and 2020, 2018, could please just turn on your cameras. And this allows us to have a slightly broader circle for the um, discussion that, that is following. Thank you very, very much, everyone. And uh, we are very much looking forward to this conversation. I understand that Professor Qin Tianbao, who is online with us and is also, of course, um, one of our um, uh, speakers, in, especially in the um, uh, what is coming up, uh, um, the closing remarks, um, might have a few questions for the panel and a few things that he'd like to raise as a way to get us started in this exchange. We will, of course, um, go a little bit beyond the time we'd originally hoped, but I will only be able to allocate 10 minutes for this discussion before we move into the second round table. So I do want to encourage all of you to think of what your questions are. I'm going to take three questions or interventions and then come back to our legal experts to expand on the ideas that they started us with. So Professor Quinn, do you have any questions or, or brief comments you'd like to make? Oh, <laughs> thank you so much for... Uh... Uh, wonderful opportunities for to join in this uh, this uh, session. Uh, I'm so sorry because I'm now in uh, Shanghai for uh, academic uh, conference and uh, I missed the uh, first uh, uh, half an hour. So I, I prefer to listen in to the following sessions and then to join in the discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, that was a very brief intervention, and we shall be coming <laughs> back to you indeed for your for your closing remarks. Have we got other questions or comments that, that are coming from different countries? And please do introduce yourself, um, but focus especially on your question. 
I noticed that um, we're, we're joined by one of the world's experts coming in from Harvard University who works on uh, oceans and the linkages with oceans and marine life. So I'm wondering whether I can shortly put Hiroko Muraki Gottlieb on the spot if she has any questions. Um, if you want to, me to come back to you, of course, you can say so. No, thank you very much for this opportunity. I think the points made about um, the role of business in the private sector, I think is incredibly important and in mobilizing uh, funding. And I guess this question can go to all of the, uh, the speakers who've made incredible points um, who, so far. What could be done in terms of incentivizing? Would it be to, um, to, uh, to emphasize a point that nature-based solutions is good for not just, you know, not just greenwashing, blue washing, but also uh, that it does impact the bottom line. Thank you. That's an excellent point. I'd like to take two more brief questions if, if they are available, including from um, the legal experts that will be joining us on the next panel, of course. Please, yes, Professor or Dr. Krupp. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to intervene. Um, a short question. At the moment, the international public is discussing uh, the One Health approach when it comes to a COVID pandemic. What role will it play uh, in the upcoming coming conference? Uh, Frederick, uh, you mentioned uh, that this One Health approach, which uh, means uh, a very broad approach, uh, which prevents the pandemics uh, by improving cooperation, interdisciplinary cooperation. This One Health approach is something I think is more or less discussed in the health context. What role does it play now in the field of uh, preparation of Kunli? Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And um, I'm going to open up just for Professor Christina and also for advocate Ayman Jerkawi um, coming in from Norway and Morocco. <laughs> So uh, I think they'll have different enough questions that we should be letting them both speak. Please, Christina. Thank you, uh, Professor Marikia Korunia Seger, and thank you to the uh, to the speakers at this first roundtable. It's really a fascinating and very important discussion. Uh, some of the speakers uh, pointed towards the need to look at different challenges in an integrated manner, speak climate change and the biodiversity crisis and the pollution crisis. We have a whole host of different crises, but both internationally, but also m in most domestic systems, these issues are being dealt with in silos, more or less. But we all recognize that there is a need for more integrated uh, uh, responses, in particular legal responses, and I was wondering if if some of these speakers had examples, legal examples, examples of laws or regulations that look at these uh, crises in an integrated manner and provide solution of how to mainstream these uh, into the into the legal system. Excellent, thank you. And I'm going to come around as well to um, Maître Ayman Shirkawi. And then I'll take a second round of questions, including with Stacy in just a minute. Um, not just with Stacy, but also from our Zoom moderators, three of the questions from online. Please go ahead, Ayman. Thank you very much, my, my pleasure. Uh, I had two reactions, actually. The first one uh, is exactly what Christina just said in terms of uh, looking at interaction, interlinkages, interfaces about this uh, various crisis that you're confronted with. And, uh, well, just anecdotally, as we all know, we're celebrating the Biological um, Diversity Day. In a few weeks, it'll be the World Environment Day. Right after that, we have the World Oceans Day. And all those topics are very, very connected and interlinked. And I wanted to, uh, I guess, uh, get a bit more uh, input uh, from our uh, esteemed panelists about those, those interfaces. Uh, the second point uh, I wanted to raise would be uh, addressed directly to Professor Kibugi uh, as for how he feels that the Pan-African Action Agenda on Ecosystem Restoration for Increased Resilience uh, connects with the type of considerations that we have uh, had during the, uh, the, the, the event so far. Thank you very much. Excellent. I'm going to come back now to our roundtable legal experts and maybe ask um, if uh, 
maybe would be fair and ask if uh, if if Frederick and Robert would like to take the first couple and then come back around to Jorge and if Bala can um, uh, you know put through his camera again then then he could also try to answer as well. So uh, Frederick and Robert, do either of you have comments on any of those questions that have been raised? Yeah, sure. Um... I think I can respond to some of them and, uh, and others I might not be able to. Um, in terms of the, the incentivizing and uh, creating incentives that aren't just um, ways for, for corporations to uh, claim to be acting in a way that is necessary, but, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I think it is challenging, and I think that uh, I like this idea that's been going around in terms of ensuring that investments are actually biodiversity positive and not just aiming to say it, this is at best neutral um, as, a, as an intervention, as an investment that, you know, I'm, I'm aiming to minimize harm or, you know, aim to kind of keep things the way they are. But, um, you know, I think it'd be interesting to be able to incentivize activities that are working with, for example, uh, degraded lands where, you know, the intervention is a net positive one, uh, where the ecosystems end up in better situation than they were previously. And I think we're working in a lot of, regardless if it's whether it's, you know, deforested or just a degraded ecosystem, there are a lot of ecosystems, especially, you know, around urban areas where there's a need to intervene in a, in a positive way and those could be beneficial for both uh, you know commercial actors uh, and also communities and, and the environment at the same time Thank so yeah. yeah yeah excellent point and uh, Robert answers to any of the questions asked yeah oh yes thank you thank you very much um, I do have um, a few I'll, I'll, uh, to respond to that I can go with Eamon's last question I think I like uh, I like a couple of things about the Pan African Agenda. Uh, one is that it it is cross cutting again uh, around a number of key economic activities uh, that have an impact on uh, biodiversity, and also involves uh, a large number of stakeholders that exceed state actors. Uh, and this includes, for example, the role of civil society. Uh, what I think would be very helpful is to then have a mechanism for peer peer review or shadow reporting to see how the, the state commitments that are listed uh, in in that agenda per country uh, one relate or are reflected in the second NBSAPs and secondly how well they are implemented nationally. Uh, without that, then it becomes really difficult, and that's why I think the role of civil society in it is extremely uh, important. I would also want to uh, uh, speak to the question by Christina a, a bit indirectly. Is uh, th there is a lot of uh, 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 for example, in Kenya, around significant actions around uh, improving resilience and linking with biodiversity intensive uh, efforts. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of this in agriculture, uh, where there is a lot of a t effort to, for instance, uh, pl promote uh, moderate forms of climate smart agriculture that don't upset resilience because it's smallholder agriculture. And in discussions this week uh, with various stakeholders, a lot of conversation on groundwater and discussions about development of a very clear adaptation plan that is related with the management of, of groundwater, which I think is quite useful because we seem to be governing, uh, focusing a lot on surface water and missing out on groundwater. But the problem is that with, with, with a lot of degradation, we then end up with a lot of runoff and natural recharges are not working and this is then having both effect because that means that the resources are all even more susceptible to to climate uh, uh, climate shocks um i think let me just take those two i think the others have been taken sufficiently thank you yes i think i think we're 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 moving forward very quickly on on answering the first round of questions and we have some people ready with a few extra questions including coming in online so I'm going to first turn to, to Stacey Alvarez and also Dr. Elifu Raha, because of course, 
not only did you have your hands up, but also I know you're not speaking on the next round table, but I'm, I'm hoping that Kent will have a chance to ask his question as well, because I think it's probably a really interesting one. And then I'm also going to ask Danting Fan to um, share three questions that have come through the chat and hopefully come back around to Dr. Kent and then Forty and Bala to answer if they can. So Stacy, please go ahead. Hi there, thanks everyone. Well, good morning from Barbados. I'm joining from Barbados. Thank you very, very much for including me as an intervener. I really feel deeply honored to be here and thanks for the, um, the insights that uh, everyone has shared so far. And my question really focuses on um, how do the panelists see the role of youth in incentivizing more ambitious long-term biodiversity strategies? And, uh, you know, in the context of pandemic recovery investments, again, where do you see the role of youth as fitting into even in the agricultural sector, if we want to look at agriculture and food security to trying to link that to biodiversity, because I think there has to be a holistic approach. At least we're seeing that in our region. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a question. Thanks again for having me here. Sorry, I was muted. Please, Dr. Eli Furaha, go ahead with your question. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me. I think uh, all presenters have uh, uh, raised a very important uh, point. And uh, for the sake of time, uh, I think uh, Dr. Kibogi has raised a very important uh, point that is very dear to my heart, uh, the issue uh, of uh, uh, increasing level of inequalities. And I can attest to that based on my previous work as a member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, where biodiversity issues uh, and the mitigation measures uh, would inevitably uh, cause uh, a lot of damage uh, to indigenous peoples in terms of their culture and the traditions and homes. Uh, so my question to Dr. Kibogi really, in, in the context of Africa, where even recognition, indigenous peoples are not recognized, but we're uh, seeing increased the levels of violations as attested by many uh, cases that come to Arusha for the African Court on Human and People's Rights. What can be done uh, post 2020 to make sure that uh, we can conserve biodiversity, but not really uh, cause uh, irreparable damage to indigenous communities? Thank you. I'm, I'm very tempted if we have time to come back to um, uh, Basil for, for an answer to that one, because I know the indigenous peoples and the reconciliation agenda is such an important part of Canada's policy as well. But first I will, I will um, be well behaved and ask Dan Ting to simply mention, I believe she has three questions and one of them is a combined question that has been um, given, uh, related aspects of it have been asked by, by people from very diverse places. So Dan Ting, do you want to ask our three, three questions from the um, Q&A? Yes, sure. So the first bunch of questions are connected with the economic development and biodiversity protection. So Kate Glick is, um, she's an environmental law and policy LM student at UCL London. And uh, she knows the problem and asks to what extent has the term sustainable development been relied upon to justify or advance economic development at the cost of biodiversity? And also a similar question from Daniel Black from University of Bristol asking um, what new laws are needed to radically mitigate the root cause of political and commercial drivers of biodiversity loss. And um, Juana from Global Forest uh, Coalition is more focusing on the angle of corporate and ask how to uh, reinforce national laws to avoid the corporate capture of policymaking and implementation uh, spaces. And he is uh, referring to an, uh, a UN link um, in the Q&A box. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, those would, would be the first bunch of questions on economic issue and biodiversity. Excellent. So I'm going to come to um, a Jorge and Bala to give us a few brief answers to those questions. And then um, what I will try to do is to also give in the next round table a chance for Robert 
and uh, and others to to be able to comment on the indigenous people's question in particular. But I think both Jorge and Bala have a few things they can say about that as well. Um, Jorge, which of the questions can you pick up on for us? Perhaps I can try um, the last one on the capture by corporates of the policymakers or something like that. Um, yes, I think uh, um, Juana, I think Juana, I think you you are right. This is uh, of course a risk, and we have seen that in, in many countries, even in my own country, of course, Costa Rica. Uh, this is something that is happening uh, in, in different in different cases. We are now struggling uh, to ratify the Escazú Agreement, and the main arguments right now are because of the lack of uh, legal certainty, they are affecting businesses, and there is a very strong responses for the business community uh, pushing pressure on the policies, on the policy makers, sorry, on the, on the members of the parliament uh, to avoid the ratification. Uh, this is happening right now. It's very, very strong and it's having uh, the, the expected outcome of Costa Rica not being part of the Escazú Agreement. Uh, right now, that's the, that's the true. We don't have the necessary votes to pass the treaty, and especially because of the pressure by the commercial and industrial sector. So this is true, but I'm a, an, an optimistic person. I am to have seen many other cases in which environmental laws uh, has had the effect of promoting sustainability, and I, I agree with the idea of sustainability as a key as a key concept, I mean, uh, guiding us in this, in the efforts to combat uh, climate change or biodiversity, uh, uh, biodiversity destruction. So I think this is true, uh, but I think you have several ways to uh, at least avoid or minimize this risk. And again, there are very, very good chances that you can put forward laws that are exemplary and that can help you to achieve your biodiversity, climate change, or, or development uh, uh, objectives. Thank you. I'm yep. going to stop here, yes, sorry. But if you can put into the chat um, uh, the Q&A for everyone to be able to see um, some of the links to the research you've done on exactly those laws, I think it would help us to answer um, the question from Daniel and also from, from Juana as well as a new question I've seen that came in from uh, Shmuel um, Yerushalmi, a social activist in Israel. Um, I would like to just come back to Bala and if you could address just one or two of these questions, maybe including um, now that you're at UNEP again, my friend, um, UNEP has done some really amazing work with the uh, youth. And I wonder if you could also answer Stacy's question. Sure, I was just about to start with uh, that question from Stacy. <laughs> The, uh, the pandemic, uh, the ambitions of the biodiversity uh, discussions currently ongoing. And of course, when the pandemic had hit, a lot of us who work on an environment in general, biodiversity in particular, the biggest apprehension we had was the fear in terms of the mismatch between the recovery, the economic recovery versus the environmental priorities that countries are going to be putting on table. But of course, the trends of such kind of recovery packages so far, I won't say is brilliantly encouraging, but it is definitely be a very uh, optimistic in terms of things are beginning to go in the right direction. There was a report that was launched by UNAP a couple of weeks ago, which said that close to 18%, it's a small percentage, but still it is a number that we can reckon with of the global recovery programs from the pandemic, uh, specifically are addressing issues of better environmental management, dealing with better ways of uh, uh, protecting biodiversity and uh, <clears throat> forest uh, related issues. But having said that, two very specific points that we should definitely consider as we prepare for the global biodiversity framework. There was a mention about One Health. Certainly that's going to be a very, very important element where we bring in the human health, the environmental health and the animal health all together in terms of addressing the issue of how to deal with the future. Uh, so that it's just not about protecting the biodiversity uh, keeping the integrity of the forests uh, intact, but also in trying to ensure that countries come up with better recovery plans and also prepare, uh, you know, for, for the future. The second point with respect to the youth, certainly yes, because as you know, currently the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, a large number of national and regional youth networks are actively contributing 
unlike before, for, for some of you who have participated in the ongoing Substand SBI discussions, you would have sort of seen the, the, the kind of uh, intention and the kind of rigor and also the kind of anxiety with which the youth actually are trying to uh, project their interests and their intent in terms of not only getting engaged into the process, but also ensuring that the outcomes are right so that they will have a place uh, they will have uh, an important role to play in implementation and shaping the future agenda at national and local level. So certainly it's receiving a lot more of attention than before. We have the UCM Congress for the first time organizing a, a youth summit. We never had a youth summit uh, in any of the world congresses before. So that's an indication of the of the, in, uh, the successes we are trying to see. One small point in 30 seconds on the economics and development. We're making some definite progresses there. Many of you may be aware that the UN Statistical Commission a few weeks ago formally adopted that they will consider when they are dealing with national accounting, the elements related to nature conservation as a formal mechanism to deal with GDP, but also as a formal mechanism for reporting on the progress to SDGs. A huge step in terms of the work that we have done for decades in terms of mainstreaming the economic and the environmental interests together with specific reference to biodiversity. Thank you. That's a really good point, Bala. And actually, I have colleagues here in the Wealth Economy Project at the Bennett Institute in Cambridge who have been working so hard on that. And they held a party for you, um, even over, you know, in COVID conditions online, just because they were so relieved to see that announcement. So thank you. I, I will also note for Stacey, there's an incredibly good um, youth biodiversity network that we see in the CVD negotiations. They're just so impressive. They're, they're, they're an example for everyone else. And, and I would love to, if you and, and others um, that you could pass the word to, put you in touch with them. Um, I think we're actually very fortunate that young people care so much and are there and have their voices in the debate. Um, I'm going to ask if Kent doesn't mind saving his question for right after the celebration of the winners. And, uh, and, and Kent, we will have you speak first on the next round table out of, out of sort of apology and also appreciation for, for, for your patience with us. That's um, fine. And we're moving, thanks Kent, thank you. Um, when, when you have the executive secretary of a treaty secretariat coming with you and, and they're kind enough to hold their fire, you know that you're, you're a part of a wonderful community. So thank you. We will um, uh, just share a screen now for a brief announcement. And, and we have a friend of ours online who is willing to, to celebrate with us. I will just mention, um, and I think uh, it's, it's unfair to ask Jorge to intervene on this point because he was so, um, uh, so instrumental in, in creating these, these um, uh, uh, documents that we're launching today. So we are very, very happy first to launch the toolkit and specialization course, the online specialization course for SDG 15. And it's a toolkit of legal and institutional practices and a specialization course on legal innovations for delivering um, SDG 15 that anyone can take online um, offered by the CISDL. So I'm extremely pleased to launch uh, and declare these launched, um, these wonderful um, uh, new tools that are available for the community. And I should especially recognize the government of Canada in this, along with several other governments who through their SDGs program with ESDC and others supported the creation of this online course that has already trained hundreds of people, not just across Canada, but worldwide. It's a contribution that is deeply, deeply appreciated. Um, I will also just call attention to and again celebrate a book that really was the um, work of one of our um, um, uh, people who is going to be mentioned very briefly in a minute, um, Legal Aspects of Implementing the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And one of the reasons we want to call attention to this book and its, um, its excellent efforts um, with Cambridge University Press is that a second book is coming out in another few months. And it is a book, of course, on legal aspects of implementing the Biodiversity Convention itself. So I think that it's important to highlight and recognize when this kind of work at this level of endeavor has been done. And I want to again thank and recognize especially Frederick Perron Welsh, who was truly instrumental to the point of being maybe one of the main editors <laughs> um, uh, in, in the success of that book. I'm going to ask for next slide, please, because this second point is probably the most exciting or one of the most exciting for this evening. Um, afternoon, uh, morning. Uh, next slide, Freedom. Wonderful. 
So we are particularly happy to be able to announce and to celebrate today. Um, and this is an announcement that we especially are happy to be doing internationally in spite of COVID um, uh, right now, um, because of course in a few more months there will be some other announcements coming up. But um, we would like to recognize three very, very unique individuals. For 2019, advocate Frederick Perron Welsh from University of Leiden, a Canadian originally, who has worked in this field for many years um, and has made a decisive contribution both academically and also as a practitioner in this area. For 2019, Professor Robert Kibugi from the University of Nairobi, who has also assisted in the development of law and policy on biodiversity, not just in his native country, Kenya, but around the world. And I do, of course, want to especially recognize that um, I met him when he was first founding an IUCN Academy at the University of Ottawa. I believe you might have been a doctoral student at that time, Robert, but you've certainly done incredible things and it's a well-deserved reward. And finally, for 2020, who normally would have had a lovely ceremony, and of course, because of COVID, this is really the first time we can properly recognize her. I'd like to point to Dr. Claudia Etuarte Lima, um, originally of the Stockholm Resilience Center. I believe she's now with the Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights, and she's just done incredible work in this field as well. Rather than congratulate you very much myself as a chair of the jury, I would like to turn to the co-chair of the entire process to say a few words of congratulations. Basil? Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure and, and an honor to, to be asked to, to do this. Um, conservation of biodiversity has been a, a long-standing priority for, for my country, Canada. It's been fortunate enough that they let me do what, I'm, what I've been doing for much longer than they initially expected. Uh, this project, the project on the, on the, we're talking about is, is a collab in collaboration with the Economic and Social Development Canada, as well as law school and research networks across the countries and abroad, identifying current pathways that provide for the achievement of the SDG 15 in Canada. The SDG offers Canada with a unique opportunity to assess the many areas of policy innovation, as well as to craft new durable implementation mechanism that will benefit Canadians and the broader international community for the future. This toolkit is important in the way it suggests that SDG 15 targets are supported by environmental, international environmental governance systems and legal measures, including multilateral environmental agreements. And, and, and you will see if you read carefully, uh, I think the draft zero, the reference to those and, and hold your breath, there is draft one coming in a few weeks and, and you will see some more. Um, in addition, um, Canadian domestic instruments institution, we are providing a pre-existing pathway to support implementation. Um, it highlighted the potential contribution of international law and policy in accelerating ambition and delivering biodiversity targets, which is meaningful to the acceleration and implementation of our post-2020 biodiversity framework. So, Congratulations. It is a shame that we cannot uh, properly toast the recipients, but I'm sure uh, the center will find ways to do that in the near future, perhaps in, uh, in Kunming, but maybe earlier, who knows? So uh, a very big uh, hand of applause for a uh, very important contribution and, and very much looking forward to see the, the next time. Thank you. I'm, I'm lifting my, my Cambridge mug to you. So congratulations, Claudia, um, also Robert, also Frederick, for the work that you do, which is deeply valued by us all. Um, now, there's one special additional launch that we want to be able to highlight today. And um, you've seen it in the biodiversity realm, but you've seen it especially with us in the, in the climate change realm. We are now launching the call for nominations for a new award that has been opened for global leadership in biodiversity law and governance. And in particular, this award exists in, in four categories, just like in the UNFCCC, and the award will be given out in a special ceremony during Biodiversity Law and Governance Day in Kunming and also during, during the COP15. And the four categories for which we are now issuing the call for nominations are, first, of course, um, we are going to invite nominations 
for leaders of academic institutions or institutes in any area of the world that are working on law and governance innovations for biodiversity. We're also going to be looking for nominations in the area of leading government representatives who have given them their all to be able to help to move forward global biodiversity agenda. We know that many of them have made a big difference for biodiversity governance and we want to recognize their contributions. The third category is general counsel of international organizations, or even if they wish of um, large NGOs and large companies. The general counsel's category, of course, recognizes professional legal achievement and practice. And the final category, equally important, is for um, lawyers and litigators who are professionals and practitioners in private law firms or in NGOs that are out there doing the good fight and you know, bringing forward litigation. So we're going to have these four categories. We are looking forward to receiving nominations. First, of course, from the members of the program committee of the Biodiversity Law and Governance Initiative. Needless to say, if any of them gets nominated, we will shortly, very quickly, um, recuse them from the decision-making of the award. And then second, of course, from the general public, anybody who has somebody that they would like to see recognized for their global contribution to biodiversity law and governance. So I'm very, very pleased today to launch the call for nominations for these new awards. And I look forward to a very successful ceremony during COP15. Thank you. We're now going to move directly into our final panel of the day. And for those who are um, joining us now for the second panel and who are staying online for the second panel, I'm going to ask my uh, colleague, Professor Jorge Cabrera, to help us to chair it. And I'm going to ask if the interveners can turn off their cameras for now. And of course, we will ask you to put the cameras back on uh, once, once the um, uh, initial um, uh, interventions will, will, will be made. And this panel, of course, is on the intersections, enhancing synergies, advancing linkages and co-benefits between the CBD and key international instruments. Jorge, over to you and thank you. Thank you very much, Marie Claire. I'll, I'll try to be very brief to give enough opportunity to our speakers to share their ideas, which I think is the most important. Um, yes, of course, um, as, as was said uh, in, the prior, in the prior round table uh, and in, in the interaction between the speakers and, the, and some of the interveners, I think there is a lot of role for this integration at different levels. The integration of biodiversity, climate change, health, uh, issues and, and trade issues at the national level uh, and reflected in some laws, biodiversity laws, general environmental laws. But, it, but there is also another dimension, which I think is also quite important and relevant for the national poly and legal policies, which is this interaction, this linkage, the synergies between the international processes. Of course, the international biodiversity law, SDG 15, uh, are, that does not operate in isolation. So you need to interact, you need to make connections and linkages with other regimes, including climate change, uh, food and agriculture, health, trade, biodiversity, and many others. Um, myself, I, I had the opportunity to participate in different international negotiations at the CBD, the International Treaty, and WIPO. And I have seen the difficulties really uh, sometimes create a coherent and, 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 and unified policy of, of the governments between these different uh, conventions, instruments, or processes. So without any further uh, delay, I will give the floor to an old friend of, from CISDL, from the International Negotiations, Ken Dossin, the Executive Secretary of the International Treaty. Um, um, it's an honor to have you here, Pre uh, Kent, again. And please, you have the floor to, to, to speak about this interlinkages between the different international fields, probably about food, agriculture, biodiversity, and others. Thank you, Kent. Uh, indeed, thank you so much, Jorge. It's certainly nice to see you again, an old friend. And thank you, Marie Claire, for putting this together. Uh, certainly an honor to, for me to, to join you in this uh, conversation. And I'm pleased also that Basil is, on, is online as well and thank him for all the wonderful work he's doing. Certainly not an easy job. He is, you know, <laughs> corralling all the different processes in the most uh, challenging uh, time, period of time. You know, it's like stacked and consistently, 
evolving you know, range of difficulties and challenges. Um, I had initially wanted to well, ask a few questions, but I think that ties in quite well with this um, part of the of the event, uh, this roundtable. Uh, what I had wanted to intervene was on the aspect that uh, Robert raised earlier, but also addressed to some extent by, by Jorge, which has to do with uh, the asymmetries we have in, at different levels. But uh, I think we need to point out that there's also a symmetry in the international legal system where uh, laws or international regimes and laws that relate to commerce investment have a lot more clout, if I may say, than laws relating to environment and conservation. And so, so there's that asymmetry there that certainly plays, um, comes into play. And as we know, uh, when it comes to international negotiations and, and, um, and um, uh, and that uh, uh, of um, treaties and, and processes that parties get what they negotiate, not what they deserve. So essentially, you know, the capacity that they have comes into play and gets reflected and gets um, you know uh, embedded in the outcomes of such negotiations. So the interests that have you know much more capacity to to influence the process, of course. Um, um, uh, carries uh, a lot more uh, weight and impact in, in that. But uh, then again, I think with the increasing um, knowledge, increasing interest, increasing awareness on, on the issues that uh, the biodiversity is the foundation of life. In fact, we should actually call today the International Day of Life because that's what's exactly what it is. Uh, not just nature, not just biodiversity, but it's all about life and the living system that supports uh, the life that we, that we live, that realizing that that is the foundation of that, that um, there's a need to actually make everything else to be in harmony with it, not the other way around. That's what I, whatever laws, whatever regimes, whatever measures that we take should be in harmony with that nature because that's what we should really adapt ourselves to. And that theme of harmony goes right across not just the natural system, but also the international legal frameworks that address or relate to, to that system that if you have discrete laws that are you know, going in different directions, that is why we sometimes end up with some of the negative impact and outcomes of the activities that those uh, regimes support or address. So that is one of the reasons why the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, when, when it was adopted, it, it, you know, the first article there talks about it being in harmony with the Convention on Biological Diversity, while it addresses agriculture, and sustainable you know, and, and, and food security, they needed to be in harmony with the convention. And I think that's the approach that any emerging uh, negotiations and outputs and laws should strive to achieve such harmony as well. Because that's the only way we can achieve that sustainable development that we are all um, promoting and, and, and striving for. If um, the COVID pandemic has done nothing else, it is to show us it, completely how vulnerable we are as a species and how interdependent and in fact how fully completely dependent we are on nature that if we, if we mess with it invariably we, we pay the price so i think that's something we need to uh, fully um, take into account uh, when we are negotiating and trying to put in place international regimes that um, that address uh, the issues so the international treaty in this context uh, so, so comes i think at the intersection of environment, agriculture, and commerce, while addressing the, the, the concerns concerning the loss of biodiversity, it also tries to ensure that we sustainably use it in order to uh, address our, our you know, livelihood needs, our food security needs, but at the same time, ensure that when we do that, we do not you know, continuously um, uh, damage the nature that, uh, that uh, sustains us in, in, in that regard. So I think, um, uh, as I said, the, that's, the fundamental concept of harmony is one that we should run through uh, every action and every um, step that we take. In, um, in, in fact, it's actually most important as we negotiate uh, the this um, the global framework that is um, that Basil is uh, guiding and uh, with uh, with Francis. That that should be the fundamental consideration of going forward. While we, of course, we ensure that we. Um, take into account the need for food security for uh, address our other needs then we should clearly ensure that uh, that is done in harmony with nature in such a way as what well, we do not jeopardize the foundation of um 
of our systems that, that uh, support us. So I join you only while celebrating the achievement and the various issues and various um, publications and, and progress that you have made, Marie Claire and CISD all also. Yeah, let us celebrate life and, and, the, and the biodiversity and some of the progress that we've made as well. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kent, for your remarks. Uh, quite useful and, and interesting indeed. Um, okay, I will ask now our uh, following speaker, Professor Christina Boyd from the University of Oslo and also co-chair of the Compliance Com Committee of the Paris Agreement. Um, I, I will remind uh, all the speakers to please try to use three to four minutes because we are running out of time. Um, so, uh, Christina, uh, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge. Um, uh, before talking about the linkages between the biodiversity um, regime and climate change, I would actually like to say a couple of words about the current development, the work towards the new post-2020 global biodiversity framework. I know we have experts here, but I think we haven't really shared that much um, insights with the, with the audience yet, and I just wanted to have this little carve out. Um, as, as you know, the, the negotiations currently uh, look very strongly at new goals and 20 new targets and a mission and a global vision for 2050 and all that to replace the previous strategic framework which were, uh, contained the Aichi targets. Now, what we had with the Aichi targets, what happened was that most of them, not, if not all of them, were not achieved. And it is going to be very important for the new post-2020 bio global biodiversity framework to have a robust structure around it that actually ensures that parties effectively implement and achieve that new set of targets. Because science tells us very clearly we have no room for failure. We are facing the critical decade and these new targets have to be implemented and achieved. And they're really interesting discussions in the current negotiations negotiations which have also legal implication of how, for example, to link those targets to the existing obligations to have an, an, an national biodiversity um, uh, uh, NBSAP uh, strategy and, and, and uh, uh, tool, um, how to revise them, how to report on them. Here is a discussion around headline indicators, for example, which go detailed into several aspects that need to be in place in order to measure and compare progress that parties achieve uh, in their uh, domestic implementation. And then there's the idea of a global biodiversity stock take. It's yet not yet agree, but it's something that can give an indication of where we all collectively are in terms of achieving these new targets. And there may be ideas about review of parties achievement. So all these aspects are very worth uh, following for lawyers because they're very interesting developments there to, to see. Now, as we discussed in the previous um, panel, biodiversity is not the only crisis. We also have climate change. We have other crises as well, which have to be addressed simultaneously in an integrated manner and in a very short time frame. As we, as, you know, as we just said with biodiversity, when it comes to climate change, the time frame is equally short. And that means that we have to consider our actions uh, very carefully and design legal tools that are effective and can be implemented. Now, maybe some of, the, of you have seen the uh, communique from the G7 uh, climate and min uh, environment ministers that was um, published yesterday. And it's a very interesting read because those ministers from the G7 actually do uh, subscribe to transitions to net zero emissions and nature positive economy. So they look at climate change and biodiversity or nature positive economy in an integrated manner. And maybe you may also know that the climate, the last climate COP that we had, the uh, summit in Madrid in 2019, adopted a decision under the climate uh, um, headings that underlines the essential contributions that nature uh, is providing in addressing climate change and its impacts and the need to address biodiversity loss and climate change in an integrated manner. This is actually the first time ever that the climate uh, conference of the parties adopted language like that, that reaches out 
to the biodiversity world and recognizes the importance of integration of that biodiversity and climate change uh, issues and measures. We talked about what where these interlinkages are. I can only mention oceans, for example, which are home to 80% of biodiversity or marine biodiversity, but also have very important climate regulative uh, functions or forests, home to most of uh, terrestrial biodiversity and absolutely crucial as a carbon sink. So you have to look at these aspects in conjunction. And here, of course, nature-based solutions and um, e uh, ecosystem-based approaches come in, but they have to be designed carefully so that they do not create negative incentives or perverse incentives for the other uh, area. So it's very important to have nature based solutions that function and have a, a high standard of an e e e ecological integrity. The IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, for example, has prepared uh, a standard uh, for nature-based solutions that takes up uh, this issue. So it is important to design legal tools that look at this in an integrated manner, for example, by regulating finance flows that go both into diversity, biodiversity and climate change regulation, or regulation of supply chains for commercial actors that have a biodiversity and climate um, aspects or regulation of production and consumption processes, spatial planning, um, uh, in, in inclusion, in inclusive processes for um, uh, indigenous peoples, local communities and so forth. It's a whole range of issues that you can look in uh, conjunction. Now, um, I think we have a chance here in the context of recovery packages. That's in chance that maybe we didn't want to, but we do have it. Uh, and that gives us a pause and a repause for reconsideration, especially in the light of science and in the light of the current global processes. And I think that is a chance that should not be missed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, for your extremely relevant insights about these connections as well and the need to uh, have effective legal tools and instruments. Um, now I will give the floor to our next speaker which is Professor Marcus Gehring from the, from the University of Cambridge and also lead counsel for trade and investment of CISDL and a well-known international expert of trade investment and sustainable development. Um, Marcus, please also try to keep your uh, speech within the three to four or five min minutes uh, deadline. Okay. Gracias, Jorge. Um, yes, um, biodiversity law and governance has come a very long way uh, since the awkward discussions in the preamble of the Cartagena Protocol about what's the relevance of the trade obligations, what's the relevant uh, sort of, what's the right approach between biodiversity and trade, biodiversity and uh, investment. And I'm happy to report that more and more, um, especially bilateral and regional free trade agreements have picked up the challenge, have introduced sustainable development chapters. And we're seeing the first disputes arrive under these chapters where experts um, express an opinion about the performance of the trading partner on uh, sustainable development, on biodiversity protection, for example. Uh, of course, when we talk about trade and investment, we need to talk about the critical issues of agriculture, forestry, um, and at least to say fisheries, uh, because it's in those areas where I would say it is uh, well documented that widespread liberalization and subsidization has really devastating effects. So this year is an interesting year for all of those who are interested in the integration between trade and biodiversity, because of course the WTO ministerial is hopefully going to agree on a global text to uh, curb and, and, a, and a global agreement to curb fishery subsidies, which could then well be uh, the blueprint for other harmful subsidies for the climate, for biodiversity. So I'm mildly optimistic. Uh, I've seen the first draft text, which is always a good um, 
sign, but uh, of course, a lot more negotiation needs to be done. Um, we also have greater clarity on, for example, uh, biodiversity and uh, intellectual property rights. Sometimes the WTO is seen as, as not helpful in this regard, but we have self-standing instrument uh, like uh, Dr. Nandosi's treaty that actually help us to address some of those integration challenges. Um, so what are the new developments besides new expressions of the dispute settlement panels? Well, we have some innovative tools. For example, uh, a, a new provision, uh, a new documentation um, uh, mechanism in the EFTA Indonesia free trade agreement to certify sustainable palm oil and then make sure that the palm oil produced uh, sustainably benefits from uh, fantastically low tariffs, whereas the palm oil produced um, uh, in an unsustainable world will basically not be traded with those partners. And it's those kind of legal innovations where suddenly the biodiversity regime takes on another relevance. And uh, I, think, I think that's why what uh, Professor Vogt, Vogt uh, just mentioned about uh, maybe having a global stock take could be really important also for trade and investment because we need those indicators in order to make trade law and investment law much more integrated. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcus, uh, uh, for being so uh, for your for your speech. I think quite quite interesting. Also, examples of international law from the fisheries uh, subsidies uh, negotiations and also from the other trade agreements. Um, so the next speaker will be Dr. Claudia Ituarte Lima. Uh, Claudia, uh, you will have the floor as well for three, four to five minutes. Tops. Uh, Claudia, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. As we all know, healthy biodiversity and ecosystems are key to the enjoyment of a broad range of rights. And also, the right to information, public participation and access to justice are also key in environmental governance, specifically biodiversity. We have the Convention of Biological Diversity, it's 195 countries and the European Union have signed and ratified this agreement. And by that, they are formally bound to this treaty with associated obligations. So I would like to raise the point of the human rights principle of accountability and rule of law. And here the distinction in terms of human rights of duty bearers and right holders. It is important and it really brings many insights that we can uh, take in the context of the Convention of Biological Diversity. So states need to develop laws and policies for enabling to reach the CBD objectives, but are not only that, they really need to enforce them. So we have been talking about various perverse incentives that I think it's key to address them. I would like to address a specific perverse incentive that I think we need to talk more in terms of the biodiversity community. And it's the impunity, the lack of liability when there is violation of biodiversity law and also human rights law. And this connection becomes drastically apparent with the situation of environmental human rights defenders. According to Global Witness in 2019, there were more than 200 environmental defenders being killed. And here I'm talking about environmental defenders, both individual, but also importantly, collective. And there was a question raised before in terms of indigenous people, I think thinking about this collective environmental defenders. And there are these environmental defenders, of course, those going out in the streets and pro protesting and exercising their freedom of speak and expression, and also peaceful assembly. 
But also I would like to highlight and frame environmental defenders as those lawyers, legal paralegals, that are silently perhaps going to their administrative courts using legal empowerment methodologies as environmental human rights defenders. And here I would like to also, I mean, we train as lawyers uh, tend to think about international law when we reach certain agreement and negotiation that this will trickle down into the national and local level, which again, I think it's extremely important. But I'd like to raise the issue of how can we look more at this also bottom up approach? How can we be thinking of learning of what's happening on the ground at the local national level? And here, uh, there was a question also in the other panel, how can we think about these integrative approaches? And I think there's a lot of jurisprudence out there that we can learn a lot from, and not least from the one of uh, happening in Southern countries. Take the example of Colombia, that the Supreme Court of Colombia has referred to this ecological constitution. We've been very creatively, human rights law, constitutional law, climate law and biocultural diversity. And finally, I would also like to uh, raise your attention and one narrative that I think there's a lot of scope for questioning. We see international human rights law and also various environmental agreements framing women, indigenous people, youth, children, boys, girls, as vulnerable groups, which I think it's extremely important but they, because they are affected in very particular ways. But the narrative that I want to question is that being vulnerable doesn't mean being a passive victim. As we see in many of these very innovative court decisions, youth, children, women are core agents of change. And I think this narrative is very important that it is portrayed as it is now in the post-2020 uh, gender action plan. And something that I think there's a lot of potential as the UN Executive Secretary call for action highlights is recognizing the rights of future generations. And under this recognition of these rights, the UN Executive Secretary calls for the recognition of the right to a healthy environment universal recognition. So again, here, the Convention of Biological Diversity can have a key role on catalyzing that. And I could end by saying that if an ecological civilization means building a shared future for all life on Earth, that will be the topic of the next conference of the parties, then we need to urgently be thinking about the connections between biodiversity, human rights, and sustainable development, leaving no woman behind. And this is not least in the context of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia, also for your uh, suggestions and your innovative thinking on this area. Um, I, I would like to take also the opportunity to conduct, congratulate you for the award, as well as uh, Frederick and Robert. Um, um, without any further delay, I will ask Dan if uh, she can collect some of the questions received and uh, pass, pass on to the speakers so that they can react to the different questions. Because of the time, we don't have, I think, the opportunity to ask in interveners to, I mean, to make any kind of comments, but at least we, we want to collect some of the questions received so far from the audience and pass to the different speakers for a very brief um, response and answer and reflection on the on the different questions. So, Dan? Yes, I'm pasting into the chat box a Thank group you. of questions on human rights and biodiversity. There have been questions on asking um, how to um, protect the indigenous rights uh, in the biodiversity crisis. And um, 
also um, how to build the momentum to recognize the right to a clean, healthy, safe and sustainable environment, human rights and the rights of nature, and how to use an, and how to um, propel a right-based approach to help effective implementation of the post-2020 agenda. And also there's a specific question addressed to um, Mr. Robert Kabugi from Romano and Claudia uh, from Brazil, um, how to um, protect uh, the more vulnerable people in face of the biodiversity damages. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. I think uh, in terms of the of the of the question to to Robert, uh, I would like to to give the opportunity to the current speakers to to respond. Actually, not not to Robert. Robert. Robert already responded to some of the questions. So I don't know if we, if somebody uh, some of the speakers. Uh, uh, want to address this question on human rights connections? I don't know if Claudia. Sure. Yeah, I think there are uh, various ways to do so. Given the time, I will just highlight one development uh, that I think it's really relevant within the context of the Convention of Biological Diversity, and is the Emerging Review Committee. As we see, there's lots to be learned from UN human rights mechanisms from the universal peer review, from the special rapporteurs that actually go to countries and see the situation on the ground, that they receive complaints for, from individuals, from collectives of what's happening on the ground. So I think that this development could really be an innovation within the context of the Convention of Biological Diversity. I think these could help provide some kind of monitoring and reporting that could also allow civil society to provide, for example, shadow reports that we see that that is happening on their uh, human rights law. And then in terms of uh, a specific means that uh, individuals, collectives have at the national level, we see great examples in terms of the use of legal empowerment methodologies, for example, biocultural community protocols uh, or paralegals and how their efforts are really having very important impact. For example, in the terms of um, court cases where these connections are further elaborated and clarified and specific remedies are provided for these communities. And not only that, the fact that we have these court decisions, that we have these new laws and policies is also impacting, for example, certain uh, development banks to say, well, we won't invest anymore in these kind of projects that are affecting biodiversity and healthy ecosystem, for example, in terms of uh, fossil fuels. So I think the idea of thinking about the interconnections between international, national, local, and also the other way around, how the local can influence the national and global are very important and we see that happening with the broad participation, for example, of local communities in the context of the Conference of the Parties of the Convention of Biological Diversity. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, Dan, can we ask a few more questions to the other speakers, panelists? So the second group of questions would be yes. focusing on contract law, uh, finance and biodiversity. And uh, Ben Metz from the Chancellor Lane, Chancellor Lane project is asking, what is the role of contract law in tackling biodiversity crisis? And also Alex is um, asking, um, what are the uh, potential, what is the potential in the post-2020 agenda for specific targets for financial institutions or insurance companies for financing a sustainable future, which could be crucial to other sectors? So back to Jorge. Thank you. Uh, then for, for collecting these questions. I will ask perhaps Marcus or Christina if they have something to respond. Marcus, please. Yes, so I can um, answer the question about uh, the role of contract law and, and uh, finance. Um, it's, it's a very new development because I think historically uh, we didn't pay much attention to the private law arrangements that underpin some of these uh, relationships. But of course, they can have a significant impact on how biodiversity law is complied with in different countries. So having more contract clauses 
uh, like the ones the Chancery Lane project is working on, for example, with regards to climate change, is hugely important um, and uh, can really provide a, a way forward, especially if reference is made to international processes such as the CBD or, or others. Uh, one word on financing, I think changing financial flows from um, destructive uh, uh, activities that destroy biodiversity, uh, be it in the oceans, be it on land, is an absolute necessity. And we've seen the success of uh, some of the divestment movements on climate change. Now we need to go the next step uh, because financing nature destruction is really beyond the pale. Uh, thank you. I'm um, sorry, uh, Jorge, if I may, for just about 30 seconds. Yes, please, please yeah. go ahead, yeah. Ken. Yeah, to supplement what Marcos was saying about the contract law. Uh, in fact, the Convention on Biological Diversity, as does the International Treaty, anticipates a role for contract law in its implementation. Uh, and the issue, this relates in particular to the access and beneficiary components of, of, the, of the convention or the objective of the convention. That the whole thing about the mutually agreed terms is all predicated on the on the on the assumption that there will be contracts between providers and and users of biodiversity, and in that course, that the contracts provisions will take into account the needs of biodiversity and the reinvestment of some of the you know financial benefits into the conservation efforts. Of, of, of. So that is a very clear um, recognition that private law could play a role. In that, in, that, in that context, I mean, in particular, uh, contract law. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're completely accurate in your, in your view. And I think uh, right now I will ask Christina to answer the question about the expected outcomes or how to better integrate biodiversity and climate change in the next COP in December, November. <laughs> November. November. <laughs> Let's uh, yeah, November in Glasgow. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, um, th there are actually several entry points. Um, one I would like to mention are, of course, the uh, nationally determined contributions, the NDCs that parties ha are putting forward. There's now a round of enhanced and updated NDCs. Now, many parties under the pairs agreement, uh, including um, nature-based solutions in their, in their NDCs, for example, forests or oceans, um, uh, which, which is very important. However, under the Paris Agreement, there is nothing really that puts a limit on what kind of nature-based solutions that parties can put in there. For example, they can include massive amounts of uh, plantations or uh, enormous uh, hydro develop, hydro, hydropower developments, which can have very negative impo impacts on biodiversity. And the Paris Agreement doesn't set any biodiversity safeguards for NDCs. This is really the function of the CBD to put a constraint on parties' conduct on what they can actually put in their NDCs under the Paris Agreement. It's, it's very intricate, but the Paris Agreement doesn't do that for various reasons. Um, but in the context of enhanced and updated indices, it's a really important role also of civil society and everybody who can see and have access to these indices, which are publicly available, to be praiseful or critical of what bodies put in there and have, a, have an eye on what biodiversity impacts these new targets have. Another uh, aspect are, of course, the rules around carbon trading, uh, which are still outstanding and which hopefully will be adopted in Glasgow. Let's hope so. Um, but here, we actually do have the chance to, to look that, that biodiversity safeguards are put in there. I don't know, some of you may know about the clean development mechanism, and it had for a certain amount of years actually very devastating biodiversity impacts, in particular those afforestation, reforestation projects, but also other ones. And here, in the context of uh, rules for carbon trading, we still have a chance to include biodiversity and other safeguards in the context of the uh, Paris Agreement rulebook uh, elements that are still outstanding. But that requires push from you know, civil society and then, of course, states that negotiate them. And hopefully we will see some uh, positive results there in, in Glasgow. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, you very much hope so. Um, finally, I think I will pass 
uh, for the closing remarks to Professor Quinn. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you, Professor. If you could turn off your camera because I'm, I'm not yes, looking at you. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you, but I, I can yes, I cannot see okay. you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I can see you as well. Okay. Yeah. So it's uh, it's so pleased to so to, to, to see uh, uh, so many uh, friends and uh, yeah, some some old friends and some some new friends and. Uh, it's a kind of a privilege for me to give the uh, such kind of uh, closing remarks because uh, it forced me to listen to all the wonderful uh, uh, speeches and wonderful uh, uh, points. And I, I really uh, uh, learned uh, the benefit a lot from this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, panelist. And uh, actually, uh, as, the, as one of the uh, co-organizers, the Research Institute of Environment and Law, from Wuhan University, uh, as, you may, as you may have noticed, that it's one of the pre, uh, premier environmental law institution in China. Always have a, uh, always uh, put the biodiversity law as one of the priorities of this uh, uh, this uh, uh, institute. And it's uh, so uh, pleased to have this opportunity with all these uh, other partners uh, 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 tonight to 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 co-organize such a, such a wonderful uh, workshop. And uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to join my colleagues just now actually to, to, to express my sincere uh, congratulations to the uh, three uh, winners of the uh, uh, Biodiversity uh, uh, Legal Specialist, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ituata Alima and Professor Higuki and uh, Professor uh, uh, Pedro uh, Vesha. And uh, indeed this, uh, you, uh, you, you all uh, deserve that, and uh, I think you provide a wonderful, I mean, uh, examples and uh, incentives uh, to our global, I mean, biodiversity law uh, scholarship. And uh, I, I think that the two uh, sessions tonight is, uh, is, uh, is excellent, I mean, the arrangement, uh, excellent. they are some kind of uh, uh, internal uh, 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 linkage. And, uh, so the, uh, the, the post-2020 framework is uh, so uh, important as uh, we all uh, think the uh, uh, hope to, to, to uh, achieve a more ambitious uh, uh, target uh, in Kunming in uh, October. And uh, we, of course, we also will be uh, realistic that uh, it is a little bit different from the uh, uh, climate change uh, 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 system and uh, it might be not a legal one, but we have many ways to strengthen its, uh, uh, its effectiveness uh, in many ways, uh, as uh, the colleague has mentioned. Uh, and uh, actually, I, 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 I'd like to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, give three po points of, uh, three, three points of my, my, my uh, I mean, uh, ideas to, 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 to what I, I get from this, uh, this uh, 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 speeches. Firstly, as uh, uh, the, the three uh, combinations, uh, the first combination is uh, the combination of uh, uh, nature-based solution with the right-based solution. Uh, as mentioned oh. just now, the uh, Professor uh, Dr. Lima. So the uh, human rights is a very important approach. Uh, uh, to protect the biodiversity. Of course, the uh, nature-based uh, solution is the uh, new uh, uh, idea and a new approach. And how to combine these two, uh, two uh, approaches is uh, uh, very interesting and also very uh, challenging. The second combination is the, uh, the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach, and even at the international level. And like the, uh, I think the, uh, in some way, the uh, climate, climate change, uh, model, especially after this uh, uh, post uh, uh, Paris Agreement, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the bottom up approach I think is more, I mean, uh, effective than the before the, the, the top down one. Uh, especially you, uh, we can ask the, uh, the, the states, the uh, country parties to uh, determine, uh, determine their own I mean, contributions uh, by themselves. Of course, with some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, other ways. And, uh, 
lastly, is the synergy of the, I mean, uh, the, the combination of national law and international law. Uh, I'd like to give you a uh, uh, very uh, 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 brief uh, example in China recently, uh, two examples actually. First is uh, we have the, we call it the Green Civil Code. So we have a civil code uh, effectively is, uh, is, uh, entered in, in, in force uh, from the first uh, day of this year. So this, uh, this code was called as, uh, was called as a green one because it, uh, it, it incorporated a, a general, a general uh, principle as the all civil activities must follow the, uh, environment, uh, the, the, uh, the environmental protection and resources conservation. And, uh, 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 in addition to that, the uh, property law uh, and uh, the uh, contract law and the tort law uh, sections all include the articles and the clauses uh, how the uh, one, one This is a very, very interesting one. And we are looking forward to the enforcement of this, uh, this new uh, code. Uh, second is the uh, uh, new, I mean, the uh, legal documents uh, sent, uh, uh, issued by the Chinese Ministry of, uh, um, uh, Ministry of, uh, of uh, uh, Environmental, uh, uh, Ecology and Environment in China, which is in, in charge of the uh, climate change and the environmental protection. Uh, so this legal document uh, is under the, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, pay attention to the importance of a synergy of uh, uh, the environmental protection and the climate change. Uh, for example, how to use the uh, ERA system, uh, how to use the uh, pollution uh, permit system uh, to combine these two uh, fields. Uh, this is only uh, uh, limited to the uh, environment, uh, general environmental protection and the climate change. But this approach, this idea is very important for future uh, biodiversity the, with the uh, uh, other general environmental protections. Or we kind of uh, examples how the legal, uh, the, the, the legal instruments can be used to promote the mainstream of the biodiversity law. So, uh, uh, I, I, I really uh, benefit a lot tonight, and uh, I thank you, uh, I'd like to express my uh, my sister's thanks. And uh, we hope to. Uh, uh, see you next time, and uh, we will the Rio, the Rio Wuhan University will of course to support the the, the following activities, uh, virtually and uh, on site in Kremlin. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your substantive conclusions and closing remarks for this event. Um, I just would like to thank everybody, the panelists, speakers, interveners, the audience. Uh, of course, congratulate again the, the winners of the award uh, for your participation, even if we are a bit late of, after the hour. Um, I don't know if Mary Claire, if you want to say something or we close now. I would like to especially thank everyone as well, not just um, the, the legal experts who have joined us here online um, and all of the senior officials who I know are watching and has been sending messages, as well as especially the students, but also especially Professor Queen Chen Bao, who is of course going to be the co-host and one of our main partners in Kunming for the COP that is coming. Um, I must especially thank, of course, two individuals who have helped us all the way through, and that is um, um, Dan Ching Fan or, and, uh, and, and, and Freedom Kai Phillips. So a special thanks to Dan Ting, um, who is a leader, um, a young leader in this field that we are extremely pleased to have involved and leading this particular biodiversity law and governance initiative. You will know her from her many emails, 
but she's also someone who we are so pleased to have engaged in this work. And of course, Freedom Kai, without you, this would be impossible. You have the technical knowledge and the substantive interest and the motivation to be there even at three o'clock in the morning, um, uh, answering last minute arrangements. And it is noticed and it is deeply, deeply appreciated. I'll call your attention to the um, notes that are in the uh, chat. Our next keynote event is on the 16th of June, and it is especially an event on um, the global economy, the SDGs and international law, a Leverhulme lecture hosted by the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University, together with a distinguished expert panel. And there will also be, of course, a very special event in the third week of June, um, that focuses like this one as a legal roundtable, but on law and policy advances in the area of natural resources. So both of these, I hope, are events that you would enjoy, and I hope to see you there. And I thank you again for staying with us, especially, Professor, I understand it is probably past midnight where you are, and Danting, I think, for you too. So thank you very, very much for being here with us and for being kind enough to help with your excellent concluding remarks for this um, very, very interesting and rich and substantive discussion. Thank you. Good night. Good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs>